Hi, everybody. So um, we're just going to, and I'm sorry we're a little bit later than anticipated, um, we're going to have a chat with um, Nicholas, who is at Quilts from the Attic, and he's going to have a chat with us, tell us a little bit about some of the things that he's been doing um, and some of the things that he's been up to. I'm Helen from So Hot. Try and get my uh, tripod in the right place. Now, the exciting thing that's happening at the moment is that um, So Hot have agreed with um, Orophil that we are going to um, stock their special collections. So all of the collections that they do, um, the ones that come in the little boxes, are going to be stocked by us, which is really exciting because it means that we get to find out about different designers and kind of the things that... Um, <laughs> Quilts from the Arctic is unable to join. Let's see what happens now. When someone joins, anyone? Hey! Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Look at that gorgeous background behind you. I thought it was only fitting to have this quilt behind me for our little Absolutely. chat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, talk us through it a little bit. So this is my temperature quilt. Um, followers on Instagram will be familiar with it. I shared a lot of the process of making it over the year and a bit that it took. Uh -huh. um, so I started it in just as we went into the first lockdown. So just around April 20. Um, and I wanted, I'd, I've always wanted to do a temperature quilt, but yeah. never had the time where the projects came up and stuff like that. So I thought going into lockdown, perfect opportunity. So I wanted something to, you know, distract me a little bit, something I could um, do each day, you know, yeah. and, and see the pro progression of that project. And actually Joe Avery was making one at, at around about the same time. She just started one, I think a few weeks before me. So uh -huh. that was the inspiration I needed. So yeah, I, I decided to do something a little bit different. Um, I wanted it to be improv, obviously, yes. but I wanted to do something that I'd not done previously. So rather than just piecing something a little bit different. Um, so I happened upon this technique, um, stuffed applique. So it's essentially, it's like very old, original trapento. So not fake trapento. So I chose my um, colours for the temperatures, made a little key like this. Oh, uh, the key. The lovely key. This is the fun part, you know, picking all of the fabrics. And I decided that I wanted to do one fa fabric per temperature. I didn't yeah. want to do like a range. So yeah. I started from zero and below and went yeah. all the way up to originally 28 degrees because I thought it's never going to get that hot in Cardiff. And we had, <laughs> great, we had like a freak, um, a freak summer and actually went up to 32. So after I picked my colours, um, I then just dedicated um, a random shape to each day. Yeah. So the only criteria was that it had to be an organic shape. I didn't want okay. it to have any square edges or straight lines or anything like that. So I would be out and about and I would see a stone or a shell or a leaf or wh whatever it might be. And I would just take inspiration from that. So I'd pick it up, you know, maybe snap a picture of it or take it home and then just use that as the basis for these random shapes. Um, and then, as I said, each day was uh, a shape. And then each shape then, obviously, depending on what the temperature was, um, was cut out in that fabric, stitched down with the heavier 12 weight or fill thread, which we'll yeah. talk about in a second. And then, as I said, stuffed from the back. So yeah. there was a slit created um, like toy stuffing, like polyester yeah. sort of fibre fill, and then pushed through the back, hand stitch closed, and that was one day's work then. So, so can you, see... can you, so quite often when I'm making things, I can remember uh, either where I was or the kind of emotions that I was feeling or whether it was a particularly important day or something. So have you got little squares on there that have more meaning than others? And yeah. secondly, can you spot things like your birthday or other like important dates in your household absolutely you've hit the nail on the head completely with what this quilt is about so some days are just random things like i said yeah. leaves or whatever other days are um significant things that might have happened on that day so birthdays for example so um you can't see the 7th of march which is my birthday but it's a little candle type shape uh... um, i've got friends to contribute quilt um shapes as well so 
Trudy Wood, my good friend who quilted this quilt for me, she drew a shape. Um, Giuseppe Juicy Juice, who designed the, um, the spectrostatic uh, static fabric, he contributed a shape. Um, and then, as you said, sort of moods as well. So if it was a particularly happy day, you know, the shape kind of reflected that. Yeah. If I was a little bit down for whatever reason, there are shapes that reflected that. Yeah. Um, and also things like um, there's somewhere here, I think, can you see it on the screen? It's just below here. There's um, a J for when um, Joe Biden was, uh, you know, yeah. um, became America's president. There's sort of little significant things like that as well just as a record really of, of, yeah. of the year that we had. So yeah, you are writing that. I can look at it and I'd be like, oh yeah, that was that day. And, and silly things as well. Like there's one that was like a slice of pizza, you know, yeah. just because we had pizza that day. So, not... And have you kept a little key? Have you done a key? Yeah. So on my phone, when I was recording the temperature, I also recorded what inspired that particular shape. So yeah. whether it was like a birthday or something significant or just you know, to that day was a good day, happy day, yeah. whatever. So I have that to look back at. And naturally, you know, some of these I've forgotten now, like some of the more obscure shapes like this. If someone said to me, you know, what is that? I can't remember, but there are yeah. ones that are obvious. Like this one here, I don't think you can, oh, this one, let me pick one that you can actually see. So this one here was um, contributed by my friend Ben. And we used to play this game where we used to try and list all 50 states um, <laughs> of the US and try and remember and random things. So he drew a little shape that sort of looks like America. So there are lots of little stories in there as well um, to kind of jog your memory of what the year was like. I mean, it was pretty full on, wasn't it? It was. I mean, I think I, I'm so glad that I had this. Sewing in general, I think, was, was really important back then just, mm. to, just to sort of distract yourself from what was going on. And, you know, people were at home a lot more. So having something to do just to sort of take your mind off things was really, really useful. And... As I said, I wanted something that was both different, um, but something that was small and achievable in a day. Yeah. So I will admit that I did fall behind sometimes and I had to do a little bit of catch up generally as, as people tend to do when they make these things. But most of the time I was waking up, finding the shape, recording the temperature and making the little individual block um, in that one day, just, just as a process, which was really helpful to get me through those. You know, really so long. where did you take the temperature from? So the temperature was um, just from Cardiff, yeah. um, where we lived at the time. And I just used um, my iPhone. Right. So I wanted, once I decided that I was going to use my iPhone, I stuck to that, you know, because, yeah. I mean, this isn't supposed to be anything scientific or no. you know, accurate in that way. But I thought, stick to the iPhone because, you know, BBC weather, for example, was showing perhaps a degree hotter or cooler than the iPhone yeah. was. So I just wanted to keep it you know, the, yeah. the one source of information. So just every morning I'd get up, see what the high was predicted to be, yeah. and then check in maybe, you know, a little bit towards the evening to see if it had surpassed that, and then make the, the block then following that. And how big are they? Are they like three inch squares? They are, yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, I'm so impressed with They're so well. good. You can just tell <laughs> looking at it. Yeah, so three inch squares. <laughs> The fun thing was, though, I obviously I oversized this. Um, this is like an Essex linen, I think. And yeah. Right. Um, so I cut them, I think, about four inches because the stuffing, the applicator stuffing, obviously, yeah. it all shrinks it down. Um, and and actually wanted... holding a little piece of fabric is quite tricky, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And you know as well, the Essex linen, it frays yeah. quite a lot. So the more yeah. you work it, and, you know, these are stuffed, as we know, so there's a lot of yeah, self-tension. Yeah, wiggling. Yeah. Um, so once they were sewn up and ready to be tr uh, trimmed, to be sewn into these rows I kind of devised this cool like I had a, a, pa a spare patchwork square I think it was five inches six inches something like that and I actually cut the middle out of it yeah so that I could you know lay it over the stuff applique because obviously you couldn't use a normal square yeah. because it wouldn't be flat so just cut out a little hole and then used it to trim them all down to the three and a half size and then as oh. you guess they finish at three when they were sewn in together and um, where do you um i'm getting distracted by news updates oh there's more people resigning oh it's kicking off and it, it is kicking, kicking off. off they don't want to be at the party anymore they don't i was addicted to BBC news last night i was like well come I on know. updates 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 get some popcorn <laughs> this is gonna be yeah. good so where do you keep the quilt now what do you do with it so it's just actually come back to me. So it's been on a bit of a journey. So obviously this is the cover of the new book, mm. Use, and, or Use and Ornament, which is coming in the next few months, fingers crossed. Um, so it was in London for a while being photographed. 
Yeah. Then it came back to me and then I decided to enter into Quiltcom um, yeah. this year. And people will know if you follow me on Instagram of the roller coaster ride that this quilt had. <laughs> so in a nutshell, for those that don't know, it actually got lost. So it wasn't my fault. I put the all the correct information was on the box, but UPS, once it got to the States, delivered it to an old sort of um, office that uh, the Modern Quilt Guild had previously used, but no longer used. So oh. it was sat in somebody's reception on this estate, like a kind of like a retail industrial type. Did thing. you not just want to get your car keys and get in the car? <laughs> I was distraught. I mean, can you imagine? Like, I was so stressed because this was over a year's work. And, yeah. You know, it was all hand stuff. And I thought of all the quilts, you know, yeah. I wouldn't have minded if it was just, you know, a triangle quilt. I yeah. love my triangle quilts, but you know, it, it, it wouldn't have been such a heartbreak. No. Um, but Instagram rallies. So I put out like, you know, help, SOS, and people, we were doing this networking thing. People in Texas were looking and contacting friends. And long story short, it eventually got where it needed to be. It got, uh, arrived at QuiltCon in time for, for judging and for hanging and got second place in applique. So oh. I was... It was a complete up and down, you know, few days. But um, so just to go back to answer your question, now that I've got it back, it's kind of doesn't really leave my sight. It kind of hangs <laughs> out with me in the sewing room. I just, you know, every now and then I glance over and go, yeah, it's still there. Yeah, yeah. you're still there. You're still there. And then when it came back, I bet you gave it a massive hug. Oh, I did. I was so lucky because um, Lucky Spool, the publisher who's, who, who I work with, they were kind enough to actually collect it for me yeah. and take it to friends who were visiting us from the States. Oh. So they were kind enough then to keep <gasps> so it. So they brought it home. Hand oh. luggage. Yeah. And I was and you're checking in, you know, can you can you see the quilt have you got? Yes, it's in our hand luggage. Yes, it's very safe. I was like, hand luggage, yeah, not going into the hold. Hand oh. luggage, yes. So and then they, they literally brought it to our doorstep and kind of gave it to me. And it was such a relief then to finally have it back. Um and I'm toying with the idea of putting it into Festival of Quilts. But if I do, I'm probably going to hand deliver it. Yeah. Because I just, I can't go through that stress again. Yeah. I mean, it's not that far, is it? No. I mean, it's worth it, you know. Yeah. It's not like having to hand deliver it to Texas. Kind of hard. <laughs> I mean, I would, I'd do that for you. <laughs> yeah, I probably would again, because I know I was so mad. I was like, I'm never entering, entering quilt con again. And then, of course, they said, you won second place. And I was like, okay, maybe I will. Enter. Maybe I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> love quilt con. <laughs> so tell us about how you ended up working with Aurifil. Yeah, so exciting. So I've always um, been a huge, huge fan of Aurifil. So I've been, this year is my 10 year anniversary of quilting. And I've been using Aurifil um, for about seven of those years so yeah. I first experienced it um as a, a little free spool a little small yeah. spool in a goodie bag I went to a retreat and they were like try this thread and at that time I thought you know thread is thread I just thought mm. I'll just use whatever and I had been using whatever up until that point and I will admit that I was I was wrong you know a lot of people do just think oh thread is thread but mm. once you try good thread it is very difficult to go back so that's where my relationship with Aurifil started and then um, over the years, I've, as I said, I've used their, their thread exclusively. Um, I became uh, an Aurifil um, artisan, first of yeah. all, um, then an Aurifilosopher, uh, and then an Aurifil designer. So the kind of trio of Aurifil things. Um, and my first book, I had a companion collection with that. And there were 12 quilt projects in that book. Um, I came prepared. Here it is, Inspiring Improv. So yeah. the 12 quilt projects in this book inspired the 12 colors in my first Aurifil thread yeah. set. So I wanted to do something a little bit different for this set. So rather than all of the new quilt projects in the new book inspiring the collection, yeah. it's just this one quilt that inspires Amazing. it. Amazing, yeah. And it inspires it in two different ways. It inspires it in the color selection. Mm -hmm. So I shared with you the little key that we yeah. all learned. So I picked seven colors from the what do we say 32 that I used yeah um, to best sort of represent the rainbow or spectrum of colors and then along with that um not only the colors but also the weight mm -hmm. so my first collection was 50 weight all 50 weight <laughs> but I loved using the heavier 12 weight from yeah that and you know, there's a bit of a misconception that I talk to people and they say oh you can use heavier weights in your machine and I'm like Absolutely. yeah it's so fun you should totally do it yeah and I knew that I wanted the blanket stitch to be very defined yeah so the colors inspired uh, this quilt was um inspirational because of the colors but also the 12 weight as well so here it is use an ornament so it shares the same name as the book it almost blends seamlessly I know look 
um, and it has the. Oh, I can the... see the bit. I can see the wiggle. So that wiggle where your finger is, it's just yeah. behind you. It looks like a crab. This one. Yes. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember what that was inspired by. I'm sure it was something quite specific. I'll have to check that one out. It looks a little bit like something from SpongeBob SquarePants. It Maybe does. that's I'm, what you I'm, did. I'm just thinking that there is one up here. You know, Toy Story Four with the little spork or the yes. forky guy. There's one that was inspired by that. Oh. So maybe that was another cartoon or something. <laughs> um, so I picked seven colours for mm -hmm. um, seven weights, um, seven spools rather of the twelve weight. Yeah. Um, so then I had three left because the collection yeah. is ten small spools. And because the book is called Use and Ornament, and it's about how a quilt can be so much more than just something that provides warmth. You know, we've seen yeah. throughout history that quilting can protest, it can mourn, it can yeah. celebrate, it can do all these things. And our thread has that duality as well. It doesn't have to just be something that holds fabric together. Mm. It can be decorative, it can be yeah. embellishing or whatever. So the 12 weights, the seven spools of 12 weights are there for your decorative stitching, your yeah. hand quilting, you know, really making your quilt shine. Then you have a 40 weight in a neutral colour, yeah. which I use in the bobbin when I'm yeah. using the heavier 12 weight. And then because it's use and ornament, you want your go-tos as well. So we've got our classic yeah. black and white in 50 weight. Yeah. Um, this was quilted with 50 weight. It was pieced with 50 weight. Yeah. And the, the little holes at the back of the applique were sewn together with 50 weight. So I look at this collection as the perfect starter kit really for anybody that wants to try the stuff to applique technique from the book. Yeah, um, but again, then again, as we said, so much more. So hand stitching, big, yeah. you know, big quilting, um, embroidery for the twelve weight, loads of things. Um, so very, very versatile, um, and you know, on smaller spools as well. So you can give it a go. You can yeah. try without that large output of having to buy a whole big large spool collection. And that's what I like about the collections is that you've got the opportunity to try a colour that maybe you wouldn't necessarily always use. And it always amazes me that you can unravel a little bit of thread and put it across your fabric and it can totally change the effect of the quilting. Absolutely. And it may be a colour that you've looked at and gone, mm, I'm really not yeah. sure about that. But yeah. you put it on and just lay it across and it makes such a difference. Yeah. Um to the to the end product of what you of what you're gonna Absolutely. get at the end. Yeah. When I was making this, I obviously this came first. So pulling all yeah. the fabrics came first. And then I had to pick I knew that I wanted one thread for all of it. I didn't want yeah. to be changing colours. And my original thought was I'll go black. It'll be striking. And I had a talk with a good friend of mine and she was like, no, don't go black. It'll be too harsh. Go something golden or warm or something like that. So I actually went with one of the colours in the collection. I'll have to double check. 5022, which is like this. Yeah. So regardless of what the temperature was, whether it was boiling hot like the pink or cool yeah. like the green, they're all stitched around with this. And um, when you say that, it's like when people say that leopard print is a neutral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and nautical stripes are a neutral yeah it's so true isn't it, it? Is. that's yeah. that thread yeah will be absolutely fine as a neutral and i wasn't sure at first you know i, I was thinking mm, this isn't going to work and obviously started all the way at the top there that you can't see and day by day and because you don't know what the temperature is going to be like i didn't get to use pinks until what are we july june or july yeah so you know it's all very well laying it on the fabric but until you actually stitch around it then you get a true sense of what yeah. it's gonna, what it looks like. But I was so pleased that I didn't go with black, but I went with something like this. Yeah. And again, that's kind of the idea behind the collection as well, is in, in the name ornament, you know, try different things, try things mm. which are outside of your comfort zone. Um, and it might, you know, it might surprise you. Um, and I've been having fun with the other colours as well. So for the samples that I'm making to take with me to Festival of Quilts and things, I'm doing something a little bit different. So I'm actually matching the heavier 12 weights to yeah fabrics of that color then so blue for blue green yeah. for green which was something that i didn't do in this one so that's been fun as well and there's something really lovely about using the same one for the whole of a project isn't there yeah, it is it just ties it together and <clears> it even then carries on to the back so the back of this quilt i matched to the fabric i'm sorry to the thread to that gold thread as best i could and this is kona curry i think so just continuing that story to the back as well. Um, it's just a way of tying everything together, which I think works really, really nicely. And Somebody thread... asked, asked before which fabrics you used for your little um, little blobs. 
Which fabric oh, did you use? We have two ranges. We have Spectrostatic by yeah. Juicy Juice. Yeah. And then we have the Ruby Society, Ruby Star Society Speckle. Speckle. Yeah. Um, so those two combined. Um, and I pulled from both of those collections and it gave a really nice, you know, from mm. a really dark black through your blues, your greens, your yellows, your oranges. And then I, I mentioned that it got hotter than I thought it would. <laughs> and I ended originally a hot pink. And I thought, well, where do I go from hot pink? I didn't want there to be a red, like a yeah. cool red, which people would normally associate with heat. Yeah. So because I don't like the heat, I'd much rather be cold. Yes. I just went for like blinding whites. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I might as well like, oh, I'm dying. So it was you, fun. <laughs> you went for, this is horrendous. Yeah, this is too hot. All I can see is white light. Get me out of here. It's ridiculous. Um, the thing that I love about the Ruby Star Speckled is that it feels more supple than the other ones. It's um, it's really soft. Yes, yeah. I just love the colours. I mean, some of them, so, you know, the black, for example, which has the metallic ink in it, it's quite striking, isn't it? And then there's one, which I think this one here, it's less yeah. obvious that the speckling is not as obvious and they just work as a whole yeah. range. And, you know, they're perfect for backgrounds, they're perfect yeah. for, you know, little things like this. Um, I, I love them. I use yeah, them it's a really clever range, I think, Absolutely. because you can you can really put it with anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they go, don't they? They do. Um, yeah. Tell us about the book. So the book, um, as we said, is called Use and Ornament. So I'm a little bit nervous because it's slightly different to this one. So this one essentially was my improv story, really. So, yeah. you know, I, I teach people the techniques that I use a lot and then I give them quilt projects to put those techniques into practice. And there's still some of that in Use and Ornament, but I call it kind of part craft book, part history book, because... Yeah. I also talk about how improvised quilting is not new. You know, some, yeah. some people think, oh, it's that modern movement. You know, it's, you just throw random scraps together. But improv has been around for a really long time. Yeah. A lot yeah. of our um, antique quilts would be considered improvised. Yeah. So I look at specific areas of quilting history from Welsh flannel quilts through to G's Bend, through to all sorts of different examples of what I consider to be improvised quilting. And then... And and this is where I wish I lived in America. I don't say that very often. <laughs> because yeah. I think they've got thrift stores that have got antique quilts in them. They we do. don't have that, do we? We've got charity shops with jigsaws in it. I don't want that. I want antique quilts. But you are and right, I, yeah. And people, and, you know, they buy them and then they go, oh, I found these blocks in a thrift store and I'm going to repurpose them. Yeah which a lot of people are doing now. And it's such a great way to sort of reduce, reuse, recycle, but also to give life to those blocks that, you know, someone sat there, most likely hand pieced them as well. And they just kind of abandoned and forgotten about them. So I love the fact that quilters find them and I they know. know what to do with them and read Like them. I love going to charity shops, but I'm always going in the hope that I'm going to find a beautiful hand pieced <laughs> EPP from the 1900s quilt I mean, yeah. and it yeah. hasn't happened yet Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> but I think <laughs> I was a little bit, little bit like one time I went in and um, as I go through, a, go through go around a few of them and a woman said to me oh we had a lovely mulberry bag in the other day and I thought about you I was like no well my other obsession is board games yeah. so I'm part of a board game group on Facebook and every time someone finds like what we would call like a gem in a charity shop, they always post it, you know, and these are, we're not talking Monopoly or Cluedo, we're talking like, you know, tabletop board game and really obscure board games. And they go, look what I found for a fiver, you know, this rare board game from the, you know, early 2000s that now is selling for over 100 quid. And then I go in and there's like Buckaroo or Cluedo. I'm like, where are these charity shops? I need to go to these charity shops. Yeah, I love, I do love a charity shop, but I, do, yeah. I, I think I could probably do some kind of tour in the States of charity shops and quilt shops. I think that could be, yeah, that could be idea. possible. If I could do it without, well, yeah, I'd have to go to the States, wouldn't I? But yeah. <laughs> I think that that would be really fun. The other thing with your quilt is, and this is slightly random, is that I love the fact that you've got your quilt top, you've made a little cut in it, you've stuffed it with um, your filling, yeah. sewn it up surgically, yeah. and then it's been quilted to the batting and to the quilt back. Yes, and bless her, Trudy's done an absolutely amazing job. And 
it, you probably, I mean, you can see a little bit of the texture, but this is a quilt that really needs to be seen like up close, mm. which is why I'm, I kind of want to get it out there so people can see it, but also yeah. I'm excited for the book because we have close ups and things. Um, so we've used a double layer of wadding in this as well. So oh. wool on cotton. Um, <gasps> And what Ooh. that does is all of the unquilted areas, so the, the applique shapes, are sort of puffed out even more. You can do this. You can do this, yeah. So it's, it's um, but this is tiny, tiny micro yeah. stuff just to flatten all of those layers. And I think, bless her, she, she almost went blind doing this, Trudy. Um, but it's just turned out so fantastic and, and better than I can ever have imagined. Um, so the quilting also tells the story. So as well as the temperature, I also ra um, made a note if it rained or if it was snowing or whatever. And again, this is something you need to see in, in person. But on the days that it did rain, Trudy's just quilted sort of like a, a random organic shape of her, of her own and left the centre unquilted. So one ring shows that it rained, two shows that it hailed, three shows that it snowed and four showed that there was like lightning and thunder. So. It's an incredible, like, like I teach as well. So, um, like, as a data handling project <laughs> <laughs> for that would yeah. please me and yeah. would tick off a few boxes at work. Yeah, um, they could do data handling on your quilt. Is there more photos of it in the book? In the new book? Yes. So it's it's the cover. It's the, the stuffed applique technique is one of the the techniques that you learn. So it's not just the history book. You know, there are elements that you can take out of it. I talk about this technique, some new piecing techniques that I've tried, new um, quilt finishing techniques. So there are lots of things to learn. But yes, in the section that is devoted to this quilt in particular, <laughs> there are lots of pictures that you can then see, not only the applique, but also the amazing quilting that Trudy's done. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, you can extrapolate a lot of information. So you've got the weather, you've got the temperature, you've got, you know, um, days of significance, as we talked about, whether I was yeah. happy whether something good happened on that day. Um, just, just yeah, a lot of data. You know, there are a lot of data. There's lots of data to be taken from this. Quilt. It's a proper historical piece, though, isn't it? And it it's, is, yeah. Um, I think the thing that came out of lockdown for me was, thank God we had sewing. And I feel a little bit more attached to it now than I think I probably did before that. It's just that you, you had that year and it was a good thing to have. And you... You need it. It's so Absolutely. important. Yeah. And we, you know, we talk about things like you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And yeah. then for us to suddenly be told you can't go to the cinema, you can't mm. go to the gym, you can't see, if, you know, that's, that's quite a, a shock to the yeah. system when you're so used to doing those things. Yeah. So thank goodness that those of us that did so and do so, we were still yeah. able to do that. You know, that wasn't taken away from us because yeah. that would have been tough. That would have, if Boris had taken away oh, there'd be uproar <laughs> absolute uproar <laughs> no sewing machine so but don't sew go to yeah. work don't sew yeah, no. yeah. can i use a hand needle um <laughs> only if you're in tier two all right okay. <laughs> i've right. forgotten about tears i know i've forgotten about tears i've forgotten about you know like the toilet roll oh that's a funny thing as well one of these oh, again i can't remember which one i'd have to double check but i took a toilet roll and I just drew around the toilet roll and then I sort of <laughs> squeezed it a little bit for the next day and just drew around it again. I think I did that like three times. And it's so <laughs> funny to think back, like there was a toilet roll shortage. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> just ridiculous. <laughs> Craziness. Crazy, yeah. crazy times. Madness. Nicholas, thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. It's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you. And, it's been really um, lovely. People Show know us... where to find me, don't they? So if they, yes. want, if they have questions about the thread set, they can you know, yeah. direct them to you or, or me. Um, but yeah, the people can reach out if they, if they want to know any more information. There's a lot of information to say in a short segment. So, you know, please reach out if you want to ask me anything. And Nicholas will get back to you. He's very good at getting back to people. Um, what's really lovely about the, the sets is that they are like a quick fix, a quick way to get a nice selection. I think in the past, sometimes they've just been one weight. So to have something that's got a bit of variety in it is just really lovely. Yeah. Um, and they come in the beautiful boxes and hopefully we should be able, we should be getting all of them for Orifil because they wanted somewhere to kind of point people to where they could definitely get them. So um, if you want one, have a look, they're on the website, but um, and also keep an eye out for your book coming out. When does it come out? Um, I want, to, it was originally supposed to be out by now, but we've had delays and, you know, all the global shipping and, and the logistics and all of that have played their part. So 
we're, we're, we are a little bit behind. So I'm, I want to be hopeful and say the next <clears throat> few months, it's definitely this year and it's definitely mm-hmm. before Christmas. Right. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be before the autumn. Yeah. So fingers crossed for three, two or three months. But do you know what? The best thing about that is that you won't have to go and sign books anywhere when it's going to be hot. It'll be beautiful. It'll be September. It'll be just the right side. Of My the perfect hot. time of year. And you know, as I said, I don't like the heat, so... I'm looking more towards these greens and not these pinks. <laughs> <laughs> when people ring you and say, when would you like to go out? For, mm, I'd like to go on one of these orangey days yeah, yeah. or a green day. Yeah, green day, please. Green day. Not white, not white. No, <laughs> no, no, not a white day. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Thank Take, you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.